You're listening to The Open Podcasts. As Elkington pushes one down the last and online, and if it pops up, that's a magnificent shot. I knew I was really in the tournament uh, big time, and it actually kicked me up a gear, and I just even started to play better. I had great chances. I was driving it. It was just, it was great. It was everything, you know, you think about how you would play an Open. The legacy of Australian golfers in the Open Championship is storied, with nine Australian victories from Peter Thompson, Kel Nagel, Greg Norman, and Ian Baker Finch in the 40 years from 1954 to 1994. But for all the successes of Australian golfers in the past 70 years, there have also been a number of players who have come remarkably close to taking home the claret jug. One of those players is Steve Elkington, a top-class player for much of his career and a major champion, Elkington has long since had a love affair with the Open, a relationship that nearly culminated in a fairy tale victory in golf's original championship. The ups and downs of that week with the playoff and get into another playoff, now that would have been a cool story. That would have been a cool story, a double playoff. This is Tales of the Open. This is the story of Steve Elkington. Born in 1962 in New South Wales, Elkington's affiliation with golf began in the neighbourhood of his local town, with a very fun carpool beginning his journey into the game. You know, I grew up in a small town in Australia. My dad was in the bank, so we moved around a little bit. I started in a small town called Narrabri in, in New South Wales. I was taught there by Club Pro and amazing. Um, when I think back how much of an influence he used to come pick us up in his car, he had an eight track in his car. We thought it was the coolest thing. He'd pick up all the juniors, he would go out and teach us. And I think back at it and I really think that that starting point, the guy's name was Paul St. Vincent and Johnny Weidman was the assistant. When I, when, I, when I think back and I try to recreate that today, it would be like the pro going around the neighborhood, picking up all the kids in their suburban, putting the music on real loud and going to golf and being the coolest group that ever was. And this was in, you know, 1974 or something. Um, we were listening to Neil Diamond and all these. Uh, <laughs> and then my then my parents, my dad got moved to Wagga, Wagga Wagga, which is where our golf, my golf really kind of took off. It was a small country town and uh, Wagga's, a, Wagga's a very big sports town full of cricketers and uh, uh, football players, rugby players and NFL players. So it was a great place to grow up. Playing golf there is all you needed. They have a city course and a country course, and it was narrow and the greens were slopey. And, you know, one of the traits about Australian golf is, you know, we have great greens. And, uh, you know, a lot of lot of Aussies are known for being great bunker players and, and great putters on fast greens. When you think of Greg Norman and Ian Baker Finch and all these guys, now the new guys like Mark Leishman, they all grew up on these real fast greens, you know. and and um, we're lucky in Australia to have all that. I mean, we get great weather. It's very dry out in, in the middle of New South Wales where I grew up. So I was able to do everything I was needed to do to get good at golf. As Elkington began to learn the game in testing and true Australian conditions, he began a new chapter of his life when moving to the University of Houston in 1982. You know, the, one of the greatest things about being a golfer is you don't have to be on a team. You don't have to have a coach. You don't have to get you know, being told that you're good. That little box at the end of the scorecard is the one that tells you whether you're any good or not. You know, I got a big break in 1982. I came over to America and I won that Doug Sanders Junior World Championship. And that's where I finished up uh, getting recruited to go to the University of Houston, uh, you know, where I met my wife. I tell everyone that everything great happened to me in my life. It happened at University of Houston. I met my wife there. I got to play on the golf team. We won three national championships. Billy Ray Brown was my roommate. He was a great player. We, you know, went through school together. We're still together, all that. So I met all my friends there and and it's just been a big part of our life. Despite his success as a junior golfer, Elkington wasn't sure what he wanted for a career when heading to university. I never really knew what my plan was, to be honest with you. I, um, 
I was really good player as a junior and then I was a really good player in college. But I never thought of, I don't know how the young players think about it now, like they're all trying to get on the tour now to, because it's so wealthy, there's so much money. I was just sort of content on working on my swing, working on my game. I knew I, I did get in, onto the tour in 1986. I graduated Tour School 86 to start the tour in 87. And that's where, that's where it all began for me. Elkington was one of the first prominent young golfers from Australia to make his home in the United States at the time. And after deciding to turn professional in 1985, the New South Wales native earned his PGA Tour card for the first time in 1987, after finishing runner-up at Q School the year previously. But playing with the game's best, it took Elkington some time to adjust to the quality on tour. I was one of the first guys that went to America for college. So, you know, coming out of college, you know, I was a good player and I went through the tour school. And when I first got on tour in 1987, I won a tournament in 90. And I, I, I can tell you right now that I wouldn't have been able to win one before that. It took me quite a few years to feel pretty comfortable playing on tour. So, like I said, there were, I was surrounded by all these great players. They hit it. You know, the, I, I was a good player, but they, they were good, good as well. The biggest shock when you go on tour is not that you see guys that play on TV, but it's they play better than you do, or they hit the ball better, or they pitch the ball better, or, you know, when I joined the tour in 87, Jack Nicholas was still out there, Trevino, Weisskopf, Tom Watson. I remember the first time I saw Tom Watson hit the ball, and I was couldn't believe how high he hit it, and then I, I couldn't believe, like, Tom Weisskopf, how hard he hit it, he just smashed it, and, and, and Trevino, he would curve the ball so much, like, I never even thought, of, I never even saw a shot that Trevino hit in my mind i mean he would hit these seven irons with a straight shot into the green and curve at 30 yards in there and i just never seen anything like that so it was really interesting to me learning quickly from some of the greats of the game elkington was able to move his career up a notch at the turn of the decade claiming his first victory on tour at the greater greensboro open in 1990 it was that year when elkington would make his debut in the 119th open following in the footsteps of some of his Australian heroes on one of his favourite courses. Well, it was easy to, easy to f first memories of the Open because we had a lot of good Australian players that we would follow. You know, Peter Thompson won five. We saw Jack Newton get beaten by Tom Watson in a playoff. In 86, when Norman won, the rough at Turnberry that year was up to your knees and Greg Norman was just at the top of his game and he just shot 63 and the, almost the rest of the rest of the tournament was history. But I'd won the Greater Greensboro Open in 1990, so I may have been exempt. But Jimmy Bowman was caddying for me and Jimmy Bowman's an interesting story because he's a local caddy in, in St. Andrews and he caddied for me in the 1980 Junior World Cup at St. Andrews when I was about 17. There's a two-man team and Jimmy Bowman caddied for me in that and then when I came back as a pro he caddied for me in that and he caddied for me one more time in the open it was it was magical having him caddy for me at St Andrews and we've been friends for all these years but St Andrews was um is my favorite open venue because I've always been attracted to courses that have and you know people may not even like this term but I I'm I'm attracted to quirky courses courses that are you know ones that um, have blind shots and ones that are real tricky and doesn't exactly fit the eye when you look down there. There's some people love traditional courses where it's lush like Augusta, looking down number one at Augusta is beautiful too. But I've always enjoyed these um, tricky courses, quirky courses. The road hole is very quirky and uh, I've, always, I've always enjoyed that. This is the young Australian Steve Elkington. Now, on the U.S. circuit, many people think this man has the finest swing on the U.S. tour. In fact, I think he finished either first or second in a poll of his peers as to who has the nicest, best golf swing on the tour. Well, that is pretty classic. Although a 27-year-old Elkington missed the cut at St. Andrews, the 119th Open showed the PGA Tour winner a world of talent and what it would take to claim golf's original major. You know, going over to play in the UK or to Scotland, as you said, there in, in the Open, you know, got to see some of the other players that I hadn't seen before, you know, like Ballesteris, like Sandy Lyle, Woosnam, Sam Torrance, all these all these guys, 
Eamon Darcy, who had a crazy swing. I remember standing behind him watching how good he hit the ball with his crazy swing. And they all, when you when you think of the UK golfers or the European players, they sort of all come up from the same style as I did, coming from their own small village or sm- own small town that they became a tour player. This is Steve Elkington, uh, an Australian golfer who had a very good victory in the United States Tour just a, a few weeks ago. He's come on a long way, and hasn't he? Yes, he's playing nicely. He has a great swing. I think he's recognised as having the finest, if not uh, the, one of the finest in the world of golf, really. Um, swings, Steve. In 1991, just a year after playing in his first Open, Elkington would claim the Players' Championship and establish himself as a must-watch player with a classical swing. I played with Steve when he won at the TPC and uh, he was uh, just a model of consistency, played everything very well and didn't let the pressure get to him too much, which is uh, amazing for a guy so young in such a big tournament. And at the Open in 1991, the man affectionately known as Elk found himself just one shot adrift at Royal Birkdale after two days but came home to finish in a tie for 44th. Elkington would make his next four cuts at the Open from 1991 and develop into one of the best players on tour, winning his home Australian Open and three more times on the PGA Tour by the beginning of 1995. In that time, Elk also recorded his first two major top tens, including a top three finish at the Masters in 1993. But in 1995, Elkington came back to one of his favourite courses, St Andrews, intent to give himself a chance to claim the championship he had been watching since he was a boy. Australian, of course, now resident really in Texas. And a very gentle first shot. When the 95 Open at St Andrews, one thing I one thing I felt really good about at St Andrews was I really knew the course well from being around Jimmy Bowman for two other trips around St Andrews. I was really comfortable. I knew everything there was for me to know about St Andrews. And um, of course, the strength of my game was hitting the ball and the turf conditions at, at St Andrews really uh, suits me because it's real tight and uh, I bang down on it pretty good. So... I'm able to hit the ball real low, so... Thanks to advice learnt from old friend and caddy Jimmy Bowman, Elk was familiar and comfortable with how to play the old course in high winds. Over the first round, Elkington battled to a 72, but a second round of 69 put the Australian in contention, before a closing birdie three in his third round led to a second consecutive score of three under. Elkington playing from the right at the 18th, using the right-to-left curve. He said he was two under par for the round today, just about double that. Lovely little pitch and run. That would delight everyone at the 18th green. In for three at the last row, Peter. Nice three there, Alex. Yes, a very good three. Six under, a nice uh, round of golf. Three under par today. Good finish for Elkington, moved him well up into position. He's just three behind Campbell. Uh, I was very pleased with the way I played. I love playing over here and, and the crowds are terrific to play in front of and I'm just having a tremendous time. Building on the great traditions of Peter Thompson. Well played today. Thanks very much. On Sunday, Elkington began the day in solo third position at six under par. Just one stroke behind Costantino Rocca and three behind overnight leader Michael Campbell. On the tee, Steve Elkington. So we have a, a shot maker playing with a classic swinger. What style? By the time Elkington found himself on the 12th tee, he stood at five under par, and still right in the thick of the championship. From there, however, with strong winds making pace control mightily difficult on the greens, the Australian's nerves got the better of him. I played 
really good, perfect golf almost uh, at St Andrews that, that Sunday, and uh, I think I, I just I couldn't get I couldn't get enough courage to hit it hard enough with my putter. Good approaches on 13 and 14 weren't rewarded with the subsequent putts. On the green ahead, Steve Elkington, Corey Pavin. Before another chance came on the 15th. And goes on, go on. No. That would have taken him to six under, but he remains at five. Four players at five under the card, daily at seven. Again, the opportunity passed him by. Yet still, the Australian was firing at the flagsticks in treacherously windy conditions. This time on the 16th. A little hanging lie. Helped to keep it down. It could be quite an exciting shot. If I ever went back and looked at the tape again, I was just too nervous on the back nine to, to win that tournament. I just couldn't get the ball to the hole with the putter. I mean, I felt like I was either going to hit it too hard or I just couldn't control, you know, the trick at St Andrews is the greens are so flat in places that it's so hard to get your speed right. And I was a little bit nervy. It was pretty windy. And it's amazing that when you putt into the wind at St Andrews, how hard you got to hit it. And then downwind, you've got to hit it a third of that. So you're always adjusting at St Andrews with your stroke. And I just sort of got off of it. And it was partly to do with nerves. It was partly to do that, yes, I was right at the top of the open. It was partly to do with the bottleneck of that course as it comes in through 16, 17, 18, all the way back to town. And something is going to happen. I got a chance to win this. And it's going to happen right here in this 500 yards of real estate right here. Somebody's going to get that trophy. And it was just a lot of pressure. Elkington played that lovely shot in 16. You never know if he can hold this. Yeah, Oh, oh, just set it up on the right on, and just a little quiet whisper to him. And as with so many others throughout the history of the game, Elkington's bid at St Andrews finally came unstuck at the road hole. One Elkie. Started it down the right, got to land short and turn. Oh, road. No, 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 no. Elkington, 17th, hit and hope. Oh, hit and got the bounce, and that's a, a wonderful result. So, Elkington, if we can hold that, we get a three at the last, we'll go to six under. I think I finished up bogey in 17 and didn't birdie 18, and I think I missed the playoff by a stroke or two. Elkington could hear every, could hear all of the noise just a few hundred yards away, and he went on the low side with the putt. A closing par on 18 proved enough for a tied sixth finish, but Elkington was left to rue what might have been. With a number of missed putts costing him a chance at a playoff, which he finished two strokes outside of. But I remember sitting there watching the playoff, and I, I was right there when Roker held it out of the swale. I was standing there when John Daly, you know, and all all that went down. It was an amazing end to an Open Championship, and uh, I was like, "Man, I could have won this thing." It was like I was right there, and and uh, it just was gone in a flash. Elkington's nerves in the end got the better of him in 1995 at the Open. But the Australian's next event was the ultimate juxtaposition. Despite a close call at a major undone by nerves and being hampered by a sinus infection, Elkington went to the PGA Championship at Riviera for his next tournament. There, the lessons learned from St Andrews proved invaluable to Elk, as remarkably, he became a major champion for the first time, just one month after his nearest miss. My wife and I would, for, I think for 20 years after the Open, we would go to Glen Eagles and stay. It was a sort of a holiday that we went to. We'd do fly fish, we'd hike up in the highlands. We had our kids and we'd do falconry. We, we had the best 
memories ever of being at Glen Eagles. What a, just one of the greatest places on earth. And um, we went and stayed at Glen Eagles for a week after that tournament. I remember thinking that I would never be able to win a, to win a major because it was just so, so intense on the back nine. And, but going back to, going back to um, Riviera, now that was another course that I knew really well because we play the Los Angeles Open there every year. And I was hot, I got hot on Sunday and I was, you know, three or four stro strokes behind. I think I was six shows behind Ernie Earl starting the day, but I was only about three groups behind. There wasn't a lot of players between me and Els. And by the time I got to the 12th hole, I was seven under through 12 on Sunday, and now I was two strokes up ahead. And I stood on the 13th tee, and I remember vividly of saying to myself, okay, this is where we want to be. And I'm not going to do what I did at St. Andrews. I'm not going to back off. I am going to pretend that I'm going to step outside of my body and I'm going to let this person inside of me go off and play the way they want to. I've tried to do it and I've done it since then. It's uh, not quite out of body. It's just step aside and let the inner self do what they want to do. Because you put you put so many reins on yourself. You, you, you know, you try to, oh, I'm four under. I, you know, do I need to try to get five or, you know, what all these different rules. And, and really, if you can s separate that, I don't quite know how to explain it, but I'm, I've been able to do it a lot when I was in contention where I just was playing so well that I was able to step aside and let, let it go. And I just kept my foot on the gas the whole way. I finished up a course playing, you know, statistically the best golf of anyone for the week except one guy and that was Colin Montgomery who almost had identical statistics to me he almost hit every fairway every green and I remember he birdied the last three holes and I was in the scorer's tent he had a 20 footer on 18 on the 72nd hole and I was looking at it thinking there's no way that Montgomery's going to make this 20 footer and, and birdie the last three holes and tie me it's just it's not meant to be and of course he did and we went to a playoff and um, I knew Montgomery uh, I had a Scottish caddy, Dave Rennick, who uh, is not with us anymore, who caddied, of course, for Jose Maria when he won the Masters, VJ Singh, and he was caddying for me. And um, I don't think there's ever been a Scotsman that was pulling for an Australian against a Scotsman in a, in a playoff of a major. But I knew Montgomery was going to probably make a three or a, at the worst a four because he hits it so straight. So I got the ball on the green where I knew what to do with it and – uh and I was able to make my putt, and I knew his putt was real tricky because it was coming over a ridge. But and uh, that was that. It was uh, I had my chance, and I took it. Steve Elkington, winner of the 1995 US PGA Championship, beat Colin Montgomery at the first extra hole. Throughout the 1990s, Elkington was one of the best players in the world, reaching a career high of fourth, spending dozens of weeks in the world's top ten and winning 17 times around the world, including 10 PGA Tour titles and one stunning major championship victory. The turn of the millennium, however, brought minimal fortune to Elk in a golfing sense, and by the summer of 2002, there was little to expect from the Australian at majors. Having played in just four of the last 11 majors, after a run of playing in 37 of the previous 38, Elkington was searching for his best form and had made just one cut at the Open since St Andrews in 1995. But the 39-year-old felt something different in July of 2002, as he looked to qualify for the 131st Open at Muirfield. Yeah, well, to understand the 2002 Open Championship Muirfield, we have to go back a week to me qualifying because I wasn't exempt. I went over a week early and I stayed to get ready at a little course called Dunbar. And Dunbar is just across the English border on the east coast of Scotland, not too far from Muirfield. And one of the characteristics of Dunbar is it has an old um, stone fence that runs through the golf course. It's about 10 foot tall and it runs for a mile right through the middle of the course. Well, not quite through the middle, through the edge of the course. And the, uh, the wall is out of bounds. It's an in-course out of bounds. So if you go over the wall on any hole, you're out of bounds. And if there's no wind blowing, you're not going to go over the wall. But when the wind blows, it's hard to not go over the wall. And um, I didn't have a great round the first day. It was a two-day qualifying. But the second round, I was hot. I got hot and I was well under the card, four, five, six under. 
and I had to walk through the wall and play 18 back to the clubhouse with the wall on my right and wind off the left maybe 40, 45 miles an hour and I hit the ball into the right rough off, off the tee and I had an okay lie, it was thick rough and I was just going to try to punch it down the fairway and I shanked it out of this deep rough and it went over the fence out of bounds. It was brutal and I, when I took my drop... I was going to drop the ball and it was going to go back into this foot high rough, but it wobbled around and then it fell into the divot that I just swung out of. So I had a free swing at it and I got that onto the green, made a double bogey and had to sit around for about three hours to find out whether I was going to make it. I finished up getting into a a playoff with uh, uh, two others, three, three of us in the playoff for two spots. And the first hole at Dunbar is a short par five, easy hole, but it's got a bunker in the middle of the fairway that you've got to avoid. And I was in, I was in the playoff with an Englishman and a Swedish, a Swedish player. And the Swede was a like a long driving specialist, like he had a 48 inch driver and he could swing this. And he was warming up, and I was thinking, what the hell's going on with this guy? He's swinging at about 150 miles an hour. The English guy played smart. He went down the other fairway on 18. The Swede knocked it over this bunker, probably hit a 400-yard drive, and I hit a drive that went down and went into that pot bunker. Well, I came out of the bunker. I I still haven't even reached the Swede's ball, okay? The Englishman, he's got a 7-iron onto the green, par 5, downwind. I knock my ball 40 feet behind the hole. The Swede hits it on the green uh, in two. So both those guys are on the green in two. I'm on the green in three on a par five. They both lag up like this. They're both in in for birdies and I've got a 40 footer left to stay in the playoff. And I, I hit this putt and it goes down and goes in. So we tied that hole. And as we were walking, it was an absolute miracle. And as we were walking over to the second tee, the official that was with us had told us that somebody had just withdrawn from the open championship and all three of us had gained entry to the tournament. So he said, we all should go back and have a beer. So (laughs) we did. So that was how I got into the tournament. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been in a playoff in the open and gone on to win or a playoff in another playoff, but that's how it began for me in 02. As the countdown to the 150th Open at St Andrews continues, the Open's official website has more content than ever before to whet your appetite for a landmark championship. Visit theopen.com today and explore our vast library of videos as well as a host of new features, championship updates, ticket and hospitality information, venue guides, every episode of The Open Podcasts and much more. An eventful qualifying perhaps indicated good omens for Elkington and a renewed love for Muirfield. Of course, he didn't get on with the first time of asking didn't hurt either. Yeah, Muirfield's just very difficult. It's so um, it's just a minefield of bunkers. Uh, you can't quite see them all, and you you know I think to win at Muirfield you've got to hit you you've got to be so good off the tee. You know you've got to hit a lot of irons. There's a lot of strategy. There was a lot of balls bouncing. There's a crosswinds. It's just probably the ultimate test for you know long iron play off the tee and. You know, I, I think I wrote my rounds down. I think I was 71, 73, made the cut on the nose. Rounds of 71 and 73 on Thursday and Friday didn't set the championship alight. But Elk's two over par total after the first two days was just good enough to make the cut on the number, helped by the fact the Australian secured par on his last five holes on Friday. At the time, Elkington was happy to make the weekend, but certainly didn't think he was in contention. That was until he realised that evening what was in store for the next day. I was staying in North Barrick and I was going to this pub that was just a a wedge shop from where I was staying called the Oudhus, A-U-L-D-E-H-O-O-S-E, Scottish term, Oudhus. And, um, of course, we had made friends there with the people and and, um, there's a harbour in North Barrick. It's a beautiful harbour made of old stone and it was it's just the most majestic place to go in the evening to see these boats coming in in Scotland and the harbor master the guy that ran that harbor 
was in the pub that night. And it, we were talking about me making the cut. And uh, he said, what time are you playing tomorrow? And I said, uh, like eight o'clock in the morning. I was one of the first groups. And he said, I tell you what I'd like to see you do tomorrow. He said, I'd like to see you shoot a good round because in the afternoon, there'll be some weather coming in that nobody will even, it's going to be the most horrific weather. I can tell it in, in the current, in the harbour. Hello and good morning and welcome to the links of Muirfield for the third round of this 131st Open Championship. And the good news on this weekend is that the weather is holding up. Heavier showers perhaps later, but the stiffer breezes which were forecast for the weekend of the championship have not as yet materialized. And I said, well, there's nothing on the TV about weather. He goes, trust me, tomorrow afternoon is going to be the most, it's going to be the end of the world. I said, okay, mate, no worries. Steve Elkinton from Australia, holding out, round of 68 for him today, he's one under. Sky darkening, and we've still got more than three hours before the championship leaders will tee off. So I went out and I shot 68 in the morning, which was a good round. It was already windy, but I went back to the pub after lunch and I could start to see the weather was starting to change a little bit. And I went back into the back room and laid down and went to sleep. The early starters today in with 68 and how good they are looking now. And oh my goodness gracious, where's this one going? Feet flat on the ground, I think it's gone straight into the bush. Oh, Duffy's playing army golf here, right, left. He's taking his hat off, too many hats just saturated. Well, Montgomery, out in the thick of it. Well, Monty's having a bit of a nightmare today to say the least. Real temper from Tangerwood. He's not enjoying this. Who would? And I looked out onto the street and I saw a guy that could not get in the door into the pub because the wind was blowing and it was raining so hard he couldn't even get in. And I ran over to the TV and everybody in the pub knew that I was back there having a sleep. And they said, Elk, by the time this round's finished, you're probably going to be leading this tournament because these guys are hitting it sideways and they can't even stand up. I think Tiger had an 80. He was the first 80 he's ever shot. And all these guys were, and I was looking at the TV and I, I couldn't believe it was the same course. And as you know, and everyone knows in the open that you can get this type of weather, you can get this type of break. And it pushed me right up into the middle of the pack or actually above that. I think it pushed me all the way up into the top 10. On what transpired to be one of the worst weather afternoons in open history, a day where Tiger Woods shot in the 80s, Elkington found his way up through the field from the comfort of the pub. At the close of play on Saturday, Elk's third round of 68 had pushed him up from joint last among the qualifying players to a tie for 10th at one under par. He lay just four strokes behind leader Ernie Els and just two shots behind solo second position Soren Hansen. But while the rapid rise may have caught some off guard, Elkington was ready for a Sunday battle. Yeah, and you know, now I had to prepare for Sunday, which was I had a now I have a real opportunity which which I didn't have uh the day before. I remember on the range on Saturday morning guys were loose and they were throwing footballs and kicking soccer balls around because they felt like there was no chance, but I had one piece of news in my pocket that the harbour master told me that no one else really knew about. Nobody nobody even knew that weather was coming. And it was it's real odd now when you think of it, because we'd know that was coming now from from all of our weather people. But that day, nobody knew it was coming. Yeah, I was I was ready because I was playing so good and um, this was a good chance for me. And after the experiences and lessons of nineteen ninety five, Elkington was hungry for victory. In his final round on Sunday, Elkington got off to a solid start. Three straight pars were first on the card, 
before the 39-year-old hit a remarkable shot into the par 3 fourth hole to set up an easy birdie. Personally speaking, it was one of the great rounds that I've ever played because Muirfield already asks you to do so much. And um, I think I hit every fairway and every green on Sunday, but it started off for me on the front nine. I think I hit a two iron to about an inch on the first par three. Steve Elkington out at the fourth hole. Very nice birdie too for Steve. One under for the round, two under for the championship. A birdie on the eighth followed, and a twisting, turning putt awaited Elkington on the ninth to move to four under par for the championship. Steve Elkington, now watch the twist on this one. This is at nine for a birdie. In a gun. Yeah. He, he had to tip forward to stop it diving, so now you're falling short. Steve Elkington out with 33. Par on 10 was then followed by a brilliant birdie three at the 11th. Steve Elkington, great Australian player, just to join the lead on 11. Beautiful putt. Great swinger, Steve. I spoke to him on the range the other day, he's had some allergy problems, he's suddenly found a magic pill and he's feeling great and swinging great. And suddenly, the man from New South Wales, less than 36 hours after being eight shots off the lead and barely making the cut, held a share of the lead on the back nine of the 131st Open. Just started hitting the ball so great. And then when I got to the turn, I knew I was really in the tournament uh, big time. And it actually kicked me up a gear and I just even started to play better. I had great chances. I was driving it. It was just, it was, it was great. It was everything, you know, you think about how you would play an Open. A good approach on the 12th hole set up Elkington with a putt to take the outright lead. A putt to give him the lead? Which just slid by. Oh, so, so close. But by the time he reached the 16th hole, the Australian had lost ground to Ernie Els on a manic final day with a number of players coming and going at the top of the leaderboard. As we go back to Elkington on 16 green. But Elk had a pot to get within two shots of Elk's lead and into sole possession of second place. Up a little slow. He's, oh, oh my goodness. Can't believe that one stayed out either. Although again it was a close call, Elkington took advantage of the 17th hole and found the potting surface in two. 17th hole, Elkington with an eagle putt to tie Els, who was struggling a few holes behind. Oh, I gave that a run. A bit greedy there, Stephen. Now oh, Elkington to go to six under. Yes, sir. So... The great thing is that they've only got one more hole left, whereas Ernie Els has four and a half. While the eagle just missed, a birdie took Elkington to six under par and added to a very unpredictable situation. He's, he's got no idea what he's got to do later either or who the name is going to be. He's going at the engraver with uh, Appleby just finishing the way he did and here's Elkington for you. Perfect balance straight down the fairway and remember Peter it is uh, quarter past two in the morning in Australia so people have had a, lost a lot of sleep this week but we're used to it. Got myself all the way around to 18. I was still two or three behind at that time, and I hit this three iron shot on 18. I think it was I laid up off the tee with a two iron, and I I hit this incredible three iron shot that finished up about six feet right of the hole. Is uh, Isabel? That means they qualified, entry to the clubhouse, and all that sort of thing. As Elkington pushes one down the last and on line, and if it hops up, that's a magnificent shot. Elkington has a putt to go to seven under. So I was looking at the scoreboard and Stuart Appleby was in the clubhouse at six, minus six, and this putt 
would have put me ahead of him. So I thought that would be, this would be a real chance here. And Ells, of course, at the time, I think at seven. So if I could get in, I'd be ahead of Stuart Appleby if I made this putt to get to seven. Ells was still on the golf course. There was still a ton of golf, but anything could happen. You never know what's going to happen down there. So. Last night, it looked like the championship time had forgotten. But not today, but the sun shining and sparkling golf. Elkington with that seven or eight foot putt to lead the championship and have completed his round. He will have completed his four rounds. When I putt, I usually pick something in front of my ball, either a blade of grass or next to a plug mark or something that I can putt over. Um, and on this putt from about seven feet, there was a white piece of stone, little tiny pebble, and I pulled my caddy over Robert Thomas Burns, a.k.a. Bullet Bob, my caddy, who actually had a broken foot. He had three bo broken bones in his foot that day. And if you ever roll the tape, which you should, in the playoff, you'll see him absolutely hobbling up 18. I'm, I wrapped his foot that morning. Something happened, and he, uh, he had surgery later on. But broken foot and all. I said, come over and tell me if you think that pebble over there is the, is the spot for this putt, because this is serious. And he came back and said, Elk, that's it. And this to take the lead in the championship. Oh. Missed it. That putt would have put him in the clubhouse at seven under. You know, I hit that putt over that thing, but it broke quite a bit. Um, that was, could be a very expensive miss. To finish at 7-under, I know Ernie Ailes is out on the course at 7-under, but he's still got holes to play. Elkington, LeVay and Appleby in the clubhouse, no doubt, nibbling at their fingernails. And I finished up making four, so I was in the clubhouse at six. Ailes ran into some problems, and before we knew it, we're all tied. Now look at that. A four down the last for them all to go into a playoff. Instantly focused on the playoff because there's no point going back. I mean, we had a good plan on that putt. Everything everything was, you know, would have been great to birdie that hole, but it is what it is. Elkington didn't know it at the time, but his short five-foot putt on 18 was to win the Open Championship. As it slid by, however, things were not looking good for Elk's championship chances with Els a few groups behind and seemingly in control. But with Els finding trouble behind and making a double bogey on the 16th, a four-way playoff eventually ensued between Elkington, Els, Thomas Leve and Stuart Appleby. It was the first four-way playoff in Open history, and just days after getting through final qualifying in a playoff, Elk had a chance to claim the Open, astonishingly in the same manner. Yeah, so we went back to play uh, 1, 16, 17, and 18, four-hole four aggregate. And we're on the first tee, Thomas LeVay, myself, Ernie Ells, and Stuart Appleby. We do understand at the moment that they will play in two, two balls, but we're just seeking to double-check that. Nobody, not, much, not much talking between us four. And, and the Royal and Ancient, um, the committee... It, they made a terrible mistake, which they admitted to later. They split us up and they played two twos and they weren't sure. I was just standing there listening to their conversation. And one of them said, should we play as a four or should we play as two twos? Or, and, and they were back and forth and it didn't bother me because I'm in the playoff. I don't care. But uh, as it turned out, they played two twos and LeVay and I went off first. Now Elkington. Quite a bit shorter, but all right. So the first two ball of this uh, four-man playoff gets underway. Four holes they will play. Add it up, see if anyone's the winner. It didn't. It certainly didn't affect uh, me uh, mentally. I just, I just was happy to be in the playoff and doing what I could. An opening bogey was a setback for Elk after short-siding himself in the greenside bunker on the first hole with a very rare missed green. For a par, and he didn't read it very well. That's a shot dropped instantly. 
Daniel de Parr. Now, if this were a sudden death event, he would be counting himself out of it. Fortunately, with three more holes to go, he can retrieve and maybe even do better. But a par on 16, the second playoff hole, was followed by two good shots on the par 5 17th. Elk knew he needed to get up and down for a birdie, with all four players floating around par. Elkington's having to chip and run here to get over the corner. Oh no! He duffed it. He hit the ground before the ball, there's no question about that. It may just have been a little head up. He had to hit it as clean as possible. And, as we say, Peter, he sclaffed it. Well, yeah, I don't like watching players make mistakes like that, particularly at crucial moments like this, it wasn't a good shot. This new putting routine that Elkington's going through, right foot in, this is for birdie to get him back to even par. Come on, get in. Get in. First couple of holes at 34. Gets him right back into the thick of things. What time does it get dark? You know, I had my chances in the playoff. I bogeyed one. It's a very hard hole. Part two. Made a long putt for birdie at uh, 17, so I was still in it. On the 18th, Elkington stood one behind his playing partner, LeVay, who encountered trouble off the tee. Elk's drive, however, was pure and set up an approach from a similar spot as in regulation a mere 90 minutes before. Elkington drives away a second shot. Long iron, nice connection with the ball. And uh, goes to the back of the green and it looks a straightforward little chip from there. I can assure you it's like lightning. Very similar to the shot that Feldo hit here. Ten years ago, over the back of the green when he made four to win. Finished up knocking a, a great iron shot again on 18, went through the green and pitched back and made five. He's gone. Well, we've lost at least one player. Steve Alkington from Australia. 95 US PGA champion. He's out of the playoff. Just unfortunate where his ball came to rest behind the green, just against the little collar there, made the pitch so much more difficult. But as his approach ran over the green, Elkington couldn't make the all-important up and down, with another five-foot putt evading him again at the most crucial of times. And with it, Elk's chance of winning the Open Championship of 2002 had gone eventually finishing just one shot behind Leve and Els. I just felt like, you know, I was playing the best golf. I just shot 65 and never miss hit a shot, and I was just going to keep doing it, but felt like I was going to keep doing it. So oh, I was playing. I mean, I, ne I never missed a, a green or a fairway uh, on, the, on the last day. I was playing so good. I mean, my swing that week was fantastic. I was hitting these great iron shots. I was attacking. It was great. It was just, I was just playing golf, and... Um, yeah, when you're in a four-man playoff, someone's going to win it. Um, you know, Els, I don't know what his mindset was, but he had this tournament, you know, wrapped up, and he let it go, and he sort of, he was floundering a little bit, but he got him, you know, he got himself organized. I would have liked to have been in the same foursome with him. There could have been different opportunities to apply pressure, not saying that I wanted to apply it on him, I wanted to apply it on everyone, um, but, you know, Els... Els is a great champion. You know, he was able to hang on when things weren't going well. And there's a, you have to give a guy a lot of credit for doing that because a lot of guys that might have crumbled, but he was able to hang in there. I had a, I had a putt on 18 to, to be even. LeVay was even. Um, Els finished up being even. They went back and played again. So it was disappointing, but you can't be too disappointed. The ups and downs of that week with the playoff and getting to another playoff. Now, that would have been a cool story. That would have been a cool story, a double playoff, but um, it was a great week. And, of course, Dave Rennick, who I mentioned earlier, the caddy from Scotland, 
uh, I, he was from a little Scottish town called Puffiston, which is not too far away. And they had bought three coaches of people, of members, to come down and watch me. And so they were all there in the playoff. And I finished up after the playoff going back to the Puffiston Golf Club in the coaches where we had, you know, a tremendous evening. Everyone got up and spoke and, and they had the little silver saver you get for the runner-up and they were all drinking out of it. And it was it was a great, you know, it was like a win. But it would have been better if I had the claret jug. Els eventually took home the title in 2002, but for Elk, it was his last opportunity to win golf's original major. With just two further appearances the following year and in 2006 in the championship. But still the affable Australian had chances to win the PGA Championship again in 2005, where he finished just one shot adrift of Phil Mickelson at Baltus Roll. And again in 2010, where in almost fairy tale fashion, a 47 year old Elkington nearly won the PGA at Whistling Straits, 15 years on from his triumph at Riviera. Well, 40, when I was 48 at Whistling Straits, the one where Dustin Johnson famously grounded his club on 18 at Whistling Straits, that one there probably stings the most because I had all the chances there coming down the stretch, just a little bit of bad luck at 17 where I hit a great three iron shot that just fell off the back of the green and. I remember Pete Dye, who designed that course. I saw Pete after 18, and we designed a course together, the TPC Louisiana. And Pete looked at me and he said, if I could have designed that green another foot longer, your ball would have stayed there and you probably would have won today. And you would have been the oldest major champion in the history of golf. But it would have been sweet for me to win the PGA at 48. Elkington's last victory came in 1999. But at Whistling Straits, he proved once again what a superb player he had been throughout his career. Two bogeys on the last two holes left Elk just two shots shy of a playoff for the title and put the Australian in a tie for fifth. A year later, he played his final PGA Championship to date. Since 2015, Elkington hasn't played a full schedule on any tour and has moved into the world of golf media. But the sweet-swinging Australian has had a fine career in the professional game and the memories of the 131st Open in 2002 will long remain with Steve Elkington. One thing people say, well, you're never going to be forgotten. You, you never, you, you'll never be forgotten when you win the, the PGA or any major. To this day, you know, 30 years later, people talk to me about the PGA. Sometimes they forget which major it was. They forget which course it was on. They're not sure what year it was, but they, they, they do not ever forget that you won one of the majors. Majors are, you know, you try to peak, you know, I don't think I was quite in the category where like Tiger Woods was trying to peak to, to win, you know, the majors. I was just trying to be in good form going into the majors. You know, I won a ton of, you know, I won a fair few tournaments. I won, you know, 10 tournaments in the 90s and or 17 tournaments worldwide in the 90s. I was pretty good at winning when I got into contention. And, you know, I had my chances um, at the Masters, at the Open, uh, particularly at the PGA. I had a ton of chances and I was only able to win the one in 95. But, you know, I got a fair few looks at... Uh, you know, in my career at the majors. I mean, I could have sit here and go, hey, what could I have done different, you know, and all that? And could I have five? Could I have three? And maybe, you know, but it is what happened. There's millions of stories. I just got to get, I'm like a computer. You got you to gotta do a, a search. <laughs> but I've certainly enjoyed going over there to play in the, in the open. You know, people love the golf over there. Probably my favorite, you know, one of my favorite memories was qualifying at Dunbar because I was there for a week before the tournament and I was invited the kids in the town to come out and follow me when I practiced and they really got into it and we would give little lessons to all these kids and they were all genuinely happy about getting this bunker lesson or how to hit it low into the wind and it really uh, put me really in touch with, uh, you know, golf and how it started for me and uh, Dunbar was a great, you know, it was a great week for me and the way it turned out and all the playoff and everything, it'll be just, it was just the perfect week to, to get into Muirfield. And then, of course, what would have topped it would have been the Claret Jug. However, it's still a great story. With thanks to Steve Elkington. Narrated by me, Shane O'Donoghue. 
Written, produced and edited by Chris Lewis. Executive produced by Paul Sutcliffe. Follow the Championship's social channels today. Just search for The Open's verified accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and LinkedIn. And enjoy a range of features, news, videos, images and audio from golf's original major. This has been an original audio production from The Open.